Finally, this has reached Kaliningrad Island, the pinnacle of Chinese engineering, the result of inadequate selection. A motherboard that under this custom-made thick heat spreader has a 14-core 20-thread mobile i7 from a good laptop. One that probably died during the crypto mining boom. Other than that, this is an ordinary motherboard. A couple of PCIe slots, regular desktop DDR4 memory, two M.2 slots, overall the bare minimum for a baseline board. So let's get down to it and see what this mobile i7 is capable of, how much it heats up, and if it's worth considering such weird Chinese stuff. This is MK, today we will look at a board, the time for which has not yet come. And to begin with, what is this Irigin company anyway? Very little is known about it. They opened their store on AliExpress this year, so you may call it a Chinese startup. And no one would have found out about this company if it weren't for their unusual feature. They use 10th to 12th gen Intel mobile processors, including engineering samples, and solder them onto desktop motherboards. You can already find some reviews on their products on the web, and we got our hands on the most recent one, the Core i7 12700H. Such a processor has 6 P cores with a boost of up to 4.7 GHz and 8 E cores with a boost of up to 3.5 GHz. You can say that the i5-13500 is its closest counterpart out of desktop processors. It has the same core count and layout, only the turbo boost is slightly higher, up to 4.8 GHz. But just look at this board, completely new and original. No other company offers such solutions. And I think some of you have already noticed a peculiar thing about this motherboard. There is no chipset on it. At the same time, Ada reports that this is a regular B660 board. And all because Intel mobile processors, unlike desktop ones, have two dies, and the second chiplet is actually in fact the chipset. But still, this is clearly not a full-fledged B660, since even the upper PCIe slot works in the 4.0x8 mode, although physically it has 16 lanes. This is not a problem. Most modern graphics cards are already running on PCIe 4.0, and the throughput of 8 PCIe 4.0 lanes equals to that of 16 PCIe 3.0 lanes. As tests show, this is quite enough even for the RTX 1490, which is obviously an overkill in this case. Although the board will hold such a card just fine, as it has a reinforced PCIe slot. But the two M.2 slots are absolutely standard. They support only NVMe drives over the PCIe 4.0 protocol. Tests run on the fast Adata Legend 960 showed that the throughput here is not undercut in any way. 7 GB per second for reading and 6 for writing in both slots. That is, all four PCIe 4.0 lanes work just the way they should. As for SATA ports, the board doesn't have many. Same applies to USB. There is a couple of HDMI and display ports, that is, you can connect three monitors here. The integrated Iris XE graphics is still good, and we will test it as well. Overall, this board is similar in features to the simplest solutions with the H610 chipset, and the two RAM slots hinted it too. Let's move on to the tests. For RAM, I used two Adata Spectrix D50 modules, 8GB each with a frequency of 3600 MHz. And that's where we encountered our first issue. The memory detected correctly, it showed 16GB, and after overclocking was activated, it was possible to change timings and apply XMPs. But the thing is that the board has an old BIOS that just doesn't allow to select RAM frequency above 3200 MHz. And this is another confirmation that this chipset is not B660, which can actually run at 3600 MHz. 3200 is the limit of the H610. I managed to slightly shrink the timings to CL18 manually. Of course, the read and write speeds are not record-breaking, about 47 to 48 GB per second, with a latency of almost 90 nanoseconds. Alas, like most mobile processors, the 12700H works by default in Gear 2 mode. That is, the memory controller runs at half the RAM frequency, which causes such bad latency. This mode is needed for extreme overclocking, and 3200 MHz is not even close. But alas, there is no way to turn on Gear 1 in this BIOS, so you will have to put up with latency at the level of the first Ryzen processors. Although in general, such RAM overclocking in the case of a 14-core CPU will definitely not become a bottleneck. There is also an issue with cooling. Since the mobile processor is noticeably thinner than the desktop, our Chinese friends had to build a copper aluminum adapter to get the right thickness. 
At the same time, instead of the rectangular mounts for the LGA 1700, they used square ones for the LGA 1100. And this is actually good, because you can find so many more coolers for it. In this case, however, using a regular box cooler won't do. Although the processor has a TDP of only 45 watts, this particular one is unlocked to consume up to 110 at peak for a short period of time and 95 for a continuous work. So a tower cooler of at least the Camex 200 level with a couple of heat pipes is mandatory. The distance from the processor to the memory slots is very small, so I had to put the second fan on the tower a bit higher so that it would fit. There are only two fan connectors here and one of them is passive. We will run our test on Windows 11 as only it knows how to work with P cores and E cores. They posed no problems. All drivers installed correctly including the network and sound. R12 700H is not an engineering sample but a final version of the CPU. And CPU Z absolutely correctly identifies all 14 cores and 24 megabytes of cache. In the CPU Z benchmark, our mobile chip scores more than 7000 points, performing at the level of the one stop N10 core core i910 900K. But after the stress test of the CPU, FPU, and cache in 8064, I got completely upset. Even under a good cooling tower, the temperature instantly reaches 100 degrees and starts thermal throttling. The clock speed of P cores fluctuates around 3.2 to 3.6 GHz. In Cinebench R23, the situation is similar. The clock speed is about 3.3 GHz and the CPU thermal throttles. The result it gets is 14,000 points, which is only 10% faster than the i5-12400, which also has 6 P cores and doesn't have any E cores. But why is that? Well, I assume that the manufacturer cut some corners and used poor quality thermal paste. Under the lid, indeed, a strange grey lump-like substance was found in huge quantities. Ok, let's use MX4 instead, and… The same instantaneous 100 degrees in ADA, while the clock speed drops even more, down to 2 GHz. We took it off and saw that the thermal paste imprint didn't cover the full surface. And here everything became clear. The manufacturer decided to stay on the safer side. The gap between the die and the adapter is too large. I believe they did it in order to minimize the chance of damaging the die when trying to install a massive cooler. And while you can't damage the die that way, you can't dissipate enough heat either. So you have to compensate with a huge amount of thermal paste. Using liquid metal here would be too much of an undertaking, since the edges are made of aluminum and they need to be insulated. And in order for the millimeter thick layer of liquid metal not to leak outside the die area, you need to build some sort of walls around the die. Given the fact that any such leak will be fatal, it's just not worth it. I went to the nearest store and bought the most thermally conductive thermal paste. This is air cool fusion with as much as 13.5 watts per meter per kelvin, which is one and a half times higher than the MX4. I applied as thick a layer as possible and it got better. But not by a lot. The processor keeps heating up to 100 degrees while consuming 90 watts in the ADA64 hard test. That is, it works close to its maximum limit. So improving the cooling system any further wouldn't make it much better anymore. The Cinebench R23 test results have increased too. Now it is a little over 15,000 points. In general, this is close to the result of a 10-core desktop i5-13400. And it would seem there is a guaranteed way to reduce its power consumption, undervolting. You can even find the corresponding parameters in the BIOS, but these values apply only visually. In reality, the voltage control doesn't work, even if you disable undervolting protection. The throttle stop utility didn't help either. Changing any voltage related parameter is locked. So the bias here is not fully functional, and updating it is also not an option according to what the seller told us. So 90 watts of power consumption and heating to 100 degrees in intensive tasks is something that we couldn't fix. At the same time, the 7 phases of the VRM for which supply power to the processor cores, despite the fact that they are made of the genuinely Chinese Xiamen transistors, even after 20 minutes of ADA stress testing, remain below 80 degrees, which is what I would call a good result. Despite all of these problems, at first, I thought I would keep this board for myself, sell my 9700K on the Z390 chipset and use this mutant of a motherboard myself. But as I'm mostly interested in productivity tasks, after I tried it out in Adobe Premiere, I changed my mind. Rendering a 3 minute 4K video with a couple of demanding effects also heated up the chip to 100 degrees, from where it dropped the clock speed to 3 GHz, consuming 70 to 80 watts. It didn't really spoil the video editing experience, Premiere worked just fine, 
But so, such a Frankie style with a Mobile Core i7 is clearly not the best option for productivity tasks. My 9700K finished this same rendering task 30 seconds faster. But let's get real. No one would consider such a board for productivity tasks anyway. Its main use is obviously gaming. On top of that, the i7-12700H is also interesting because it has the fastest Intel integrated graphics Iris Xe with 96 compute units. And it is fully functional too, although Intel's drivers leave much to be desired. I had to completely remove them and install the latest ones from the company's website in order to get rid of random stutters. It also applies to the ARC A380 which I used when testing this processor at the beginning. But I must say, Intel managed to boost the integrated graphics quite a lot. In Dota 2 and Full HD at high graphics settings, you can get 40 to 50 frames per second in the most intensive encounter. Of course, if you lower the settings a bit, you can get 60 frames. It's absolutely comfortable to play. The processor consumes about 60 watts and heats up to 70 degrees, while turboing above 4 GHz. The integrated graphics stably maintains its maximum 1400 MHz. In CSGO, the situation is even better. At low graphics settings and Full HD, the frame rate is almost always over 100. So the integrated graphics is just fine. It is at the level of the full-fledged GT 1030. Okay, now it's time to play big. My daily driver RTX 3080 Ti. Will the 14-core Mobile Core i7 cope with it and how much will it heat? In Atomic Heart in Full HD on Atomic Graphics preset, you can crumble rebellious robots at 100 frames per second. While at it, the processor heats up to 80 degrees with peaks under 90, but maintains the maximum clock speed of 4.1 GHz for P cores, consuming about 60 watts. The graphics card is utilized almost completely by 85 to 90 percent, so the mobile unlocked i7 will cope with the RTX 3070 level card without any problems. But in Cyberpunk in Full HD, with ultra ray tracing, the cooling system is given up. Even in the benchmark, the processor heats up to 100 degrees and the clock speed sometimes goes down by a couple of hundred megahertz. When driving around the city, the situation is even worse. The clock speed can drop to 3.5 gigahertz and the FPS to 55 or 60 frames. And the graphics card is not the reason. Quite the opposite, it's just sitting at 70 to 80% load. The CPU load in Cyberpunk, however, is so high that the power consumption goes up to 90 watts and the heat spreader just can't handle it. And finally, one of the most beautiful games of our time, a Plague Tale Requiem. The processor runs on Real Engine 5 perfectly well. At ultra settings with ray tracing and auto DLSS, you can get about 80 to 90 frames per second in highly detailed locations. The cooling system is working hard, the processor easily consumes 70 watts and reaches the temperature of 100 degrees. But it doesn't drop the clock speed, although it doesn't load the car to the full either. After all, the 3080 Ti is too much for it. So what gives? This motherboard leaves me with mixed feelings. On the one hand, it's a purely Chinese piece of engineering. Not the best quality components, half-functional BIOS, and a slightly battered used processor from a laptop crypto mining farm. But on the other hand, people buy Xeon from China precisely because it is the cheapest way to get a modern gaming computer, and therefore they can be forgiven for problems with setup and not the most stable work. In the case of Eerying, for a motherboard with the i7-12700H, you will have to pay $300. And for this money, it is not worth it at all. Doubling the TDP compared to the original 45 watts doesn't allow the processor to consistently run above 4 GHz under a serious workload. The board doesn't allow to play around with TDP, and there is no point in this anyway, since the adapter cover with a large gap cannot even dissipate 90 watts. There is no undervolting, and as a result, in intensive tasks, the temperature instantly goes to 100 degrees with a noticeable drop in clock speeds. In productivity tasks, this could be forgiven, but even games easily heat this Mobile i7 to 90 degrees. As a result, the 14-core Mobile i7 actually falls to the level of the 10-core Core i5-13400, which costs about $200 on AliExpress, and a similar H610 board will cost another $80, which in the end will be even cheaper, and at the same time there will be no problems with cooling and RAM latency, and if you add some $30 more, you can get a B660 board with memory overclocking available and there's some upgradeability too. In general, I do not recommend getting such a board unless you want to try something absolutely unusual. I cannot accuse the manufacturer of charging too much for it though. 
Intel asks as much as $500 for the 14-core i7-12700H. Of course, used ones are cheaper, but given the high production cost of such a small-scale manufacturer, it is unlikely that they earn a lot from this. In any case, the idea is interesting, but there's a lot to be done here. And if the Irrigying startup takes off, perhaps in a year or two we will see an adequate replacement for Xeons with recent architectures and with a performance level sufficient for top-end graphics cards. So far it's still far from good and we will have to wait and see if they can eliminate the existing issues. This was MK, my name is Mikhail Krushin. I'll see you again.